All right. Well, welcome to the second episode of Add Water and Stir with uh, Complicated Melody and uh, hey. myself. Hey, and and uh, Adopt and Black Mom. And um, we're back. Look, we we lasted for t- another week. <laughs> I know. I'm I'm proud of us for doing our second podcast. So you know, yeah, that's persistence so, right there. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> So um, we've got a couple of we've got a number of things that we want to talk about tonight, but we thought we would first get started, kind of tech, talk, catching up a little bit on um, how life has been for the two of us for the last two weeks. So I'm going to defer to uh, Mimi, and um, you can tell us how you and the hubby and and uh, Nana is doing. We're doing pretty good. Uh, we just got back from visiting the grandparents on Wood's side, my husband's side, and so she got to meet her 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 other set of grandparents or another set of grandparents and uh, she got to meet her cousins and it was quite overwhelming <laughs> for her because she's just used to mommy, daddy, and that's all. So the kids dragged her around like a little doll and everything so eventually she got used to them and was able to kick it a little bit and uh, it was it was interesting for us because our philosophy, or at least our stated philosophy, is that grandparents can do whatever they want to do. But um, it was hard watching the grandparents give her candy <laughs> and chips, and we we're like, "But she doesn't eat that, you know. She doesn't drink, you know, whatever that is." <laughs> so eventually, the gr- the grandma grandma was like, "Uh." I know how to raise kids. Right. I'm like, okay, I know, but you know, she eats organic. You know, she really doesn't eat organic, but it's still like she only eats wheat thins. Like she doesn't eat potato chips. So, so that was pretty good. But other things I wrote about um, in the last two weeks, I wrote a little article about Blue Ivy and her hair and that whole debacle yeah. that was happening with her hair. And uh, really, you know, my point on that is one, we place way too much pressure on mothers and uh, you know the whole blue ivy situation I just kind of felt like her hair looked like what Nana's hair looks like every morning when she wakes up so you know that's probably what happened with them um, I wrote a little bit about receiving her redacted files oh, yeah. and that kind of was a hard thing for so for people who don't know redacted files are um, and I think you call them something else, dic- disclosure records. Yeah, what do the you call disclosure, them? the disclosure, uh, the disclosure f- records. Yeah. But basically, they're the set of paperwork that um, details everything that your child has gone through as um, a child in the system. So it has a copy of all the court case files. It has a copy of all the uh, monthly reports that the foster care worker has entered. It has a copy of anything related to the case that somebody has happened to file for you. And so the purpose of it is for you to read through it and to make sure you understand everything about the child before you make that final decision to go forward with the adoption. And what they're hoping is that if there's anything that you didn't know about their medical history or about any kind of abuse that you weren't aware of or even family medical history um, that you know, you'll know that and you'll it'll be disclosed to you and so you can feel a little bit more comfortable that you understand um, kind of what you're signing up for. And it really struck me um, that one, it was so, it's like se- almost 700 pages of stuff. Wow. That's a lot. And that she's only two and a half. And then um, what struck me really hard is that Maybe one day she'll she'll have to read this, right? Or she'll want to read it, or we'll give it to her to read, and um, it just really kind of hurts that she's gonna, you know, at one point in time you're gonna have to explain this part of the story to her, um, and you know, I don't know, I'm still kind of processing that. So yeah, those are those are hard to. Um Those are hard to read. I got them when Hope was placed with me. Um, Hope did not have 640-some pages. Um, She Mm -hmm. probably had maybe 200 pages, and um, there's a lot of stuff missing. So there's a lot of stuff missing. So, um, you know, it's a little hard. It is hard to kind of navigate that stuff. So, 
Wow. I'm yeah. sweating in the background getting ice. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm live here right now. We're live. <laughs> So what, what's been going on with you the last two weeks? Everything on your blog has been like, I'm kicking it, I'm having a party, I'm going out. So My, my blog is, has been like this. It's like, that's true. <laughs> it's been a bit of a roller coaster the last two weeks. Um, first, we went to Disney last week. We went, took a vacation. Um, it was really kind of to celebrate me finishing up my degree and finalization and, you know, all of that. Well, let, me, let me stop. Yeah. Not just finishing your degree. Finishing up your doctorate, you know. Yes. Actually yes. finishing your dissertation <laughs> yes. and getting your doctorate. I'm sorry, I had to stop and just <laughs> make sure that was clear to everybody. You know, it's so funny. I was skimming um, a couple. Of, it's, it's it's funny. I've been thanks for whoever you know reads my blog, but it's it's kind of interesting some of the 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 pages that people land on and read about, and it's kind of made me go back and look at some old posts about kind of when I was writing and and before things got really crazy, and and so yeah, so we were celebrating um, some really big stuff, and so we went to Disney, and um, you know my girl is from she's a West Coaster, they don't really have hurricanes and tornadoes and you know, the dramatic weather that we tend to have on the East Coast. And so um, she was not feeling the it rains. It doesn't rain every day in Southern California, but it rains every day in the summertime on the East Coast. Right. <laughs> and so she Nobody wasn't appreciate that. that. <laughs> <laughs> they don't write songs about that. And so um, she wasn't really feeling that. So Disney at first, um, you know, there was it was a big deluge. And so we had some drama around that. But we had a really good time, stayed with some friends. Um, it was great. But while that was happening um, in the foreground, of course, if you follow the blog, um, you know that. Um, the bio family showed up and um, through Facebook, and I'm not going to talk go into too much about it right now because it's an ongoing drama. But um, let's just say I won't be getting any more Facebook game requests. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, but we're waiting. Um, you know, I probably will be writing a bit more about that as we navigate it. Right now, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. Um, and then we had some drama at camp, um, which I, I told the story in no real super detail, but it was kind of really one of those times where I really kind of thought if I told my mom what happened, she would probably laugh at me. <laughs> <laughs> And I like it was so it was such a dramatic. Why did episode. you turn it to your mom at that point? I wanted to. I wanted to really like really. I wanted to go straight old school. Like I'm gonna kill this kid. Um, and I called the support group as I was kind of going to go deal with. Um, we have the support system, um, one eight hundred number, or whatever that we can call associated with my adoption agency. And I called and and um, you know she was trying to help me problem solve. This situation over the course of a couple of days, and I was like, "No, no, I need you to like. I'm on my way to the facility to deal with this situation, and I need you to help me not kill her when I get there. Like, I, I can't deal with it tomorrow. <laughs> I need you to tell me over and over that I will go to jail if I do that. Please just reinforce it. <laughs> and so, you know, it's kind of one of those things about being aware of what you need in the moment. Um, and um, so she talked me off the ledge, and she was like, "She's gonna." expect for you to come in there like raising hell so don't and um, but we navigated it and actually it's turned out to be good so you know we're, we're good tomorrow we're heading to Bruno Mars and uh, it's good so you know we're, we're living all right but we're living but I will say the last two weeks adoption got real <laughs> I know it, it gets real right at the most inappropriate times, but it's real. I guess that's so. just raising children in general, right? That's raising kids. That's raising kids. So, so we've got a couple of uh, topics that we're going to talk about tonight, and um, the first one is um, the Census Bureau report on adopted children and stepchildren. And um, the Census U.S. Census Bureau released this report in April, and um, certainly in our um, podcast uh, um, notes will certainly have the link to it, but if you go to um, census.gov and search adoption, um, you'll see the report um, for um, based on the 2010 census. And there was just some really interesting things on there that we're going to kind of 
mention, I'll talk a little bit about the highlights um, and, and then pitch it over to Mimi to kind of see what she has to say about all of this. Um, oh, by the way, if you want to ask us a question, we've got the little Q&A box open, so we'll see them and um, we'll try to address any questions that come up. Um, one thing I want to mention is um, adoption in this report is defined really, really broadly, really fluidly. It includes formal and informal adoptions, international, private, public. Um, it's inclusive of stepchildren who are adopted by a step parent, whether that's legal or not, um, in terms of, you know, they've, they've gone through the legal process of adopting their stepkids. But if they say that they're their kid and they're adopted, um, just like, like an informal kinship thing, then, you know, they check that box and move on. Um, and it also is interesting in the report because it acknowledges that different cultural groups like African Americans, um, Hispanics, and um, Native Indigenous people in the U.S. Um, have a higher rate of um, embracing kinship and informal adoptive relationships um, more so than their white counterparts. Um, so those were some of the cool things that I thought about it. Um, um, so Mimi, what you what you think about the report? Tell us well, some of I, the things you thought were most interesting. Well, I thought that was pretty interesting. I was a bit, as I got into it, I was a bit disappointed because I said, oh, I like to, I wish I, there was also some information about foster children. And it made a note to say that in 2010, <clears throat> foster children was not, <clears throat> excuse me, was not a category that was included in 2010. So I felt like that was an opportunity that was missed out on gathering information about mm -hmm. um, foster kids and care. But yeah. getting into it, um, you know, one of the things were about um, about the number of adopted and step adopted children and stepchildren, um, and they said there are about 64 million or 65 million children, and two percent were adopted children. Not that it was like wow, that is a very small yeah. percent. Of adopted um, children out there, and or people or people who have identified children as being adopted. So I said, "Wow, that's that's a pretty small number of people out there that we're talking about." Mm -hmm. um, and then something else that really caught my eye, like I, what caught my eye too, was the, about the um, the thoughts that you know African American and um, Hispanics also have a lot of informal adoption. So you know, it might not, and I also wonder, would they just call them their kid? Would they even say that they're adopted? Would they just include them as part of their family? So yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. When you look at the when you look at the data in the report, it has three categories. So it has um, um, kids that are adopted, step kids, and then biological kids. And um, there were a couple of things that I thought were really um, interesting. Um, kids who are adopted um, or identified as adopted in, in the census um, were more consistently, um, they were more likely to have consistent insur health insurance over um, the course of their life than their um, biological counterparts. Um, and that may be because in the system they end up getting Medicaid and there's certain requirements that they have to have um, preventive care um, while they are in care. I thought that that was kind of interesting. Um, they're more likely to have um, um, disabilities, most of them being in the learning and cognitive um, areas. Um, uh, African Americans actually made up, I think, 13% of adoptive kids. So it was actually it mirrors um, our general representation mm -hmm. in the, the U.S. population. Um, Oh, this was one that I thought was really interesting because, of course, you know, I'm a single single mom. Um, but 73% of adoptive kids live in two-parent households, and that is a higher percentage than biological kids. Mm -hmm. So um, so you've got the, the two-parent folks kind of going out and adopting, um, and then there's a lot more of us single folks having kids um, in various ways. But, you know, of course, you know, out in the streets, there's lots of baby mama, da baby daddy, all of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I think that certainly that's not, that's not just in communities of color, but I just found it to be um, an interesting stat that, that more of um, our kids, our adoptive kids, are um, in two-parent homes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I saw that was interesting is that um, it shows that a higher percentage of adopted children 
um, under 18 were black. Then, um, mm -hmm. so if you look at all black children, a higher percentage of them, in comparison to their counterparts, are adopted. So 18 percent. Um, then the percentage of of black children that were just biological children or stepchildren. Mm -hmm. And what they noted was that maybe it's due because there's more African Americans, black children in foster care, um, which is in mo most cases a feeder pool to adoption. So yeah. I thought that was that was interesting too. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, 21 percent of adopted kids are in single um, female head of households. So um, you know, one out of every five. So just for the single folks, you know, we're doing it too. It's possible. <laughs> I mean, I think that's. I actually think that's good to know because I know a lot of people that I've talked to who are interested in adopting and who may be single women mm -hmm. are saying, "Well, I didn't think that I could." Right. Yeah. So they're either being told that they can't adopt or they don't see other people like them um, and so they maybe don't want to push for it too much yeah um, and so I don't I think the the numbers are saying different right Yeah, the numbers are definitely saying different and that was just across the board what I also found interesting was um, so that's you know that was for single women um, but the overall percentage of single men now they're single not married now they be, they did say that they might be stacking up um, but they actually have a slightly higher percent of single men um, doing the adopting too so you know if any fellas are kind of hanging out watching this you know we're doing a single a single folks are doing it right <laughs> so across it's, gender <laughs> so um, there was some go, go ahead you know what I found also I, I was just looking through this data and it also seems that um, adoptive parents seem to be older <laughs> than in general and so you know of course anecdotally it makes sense right because a lot of times you hear that infertility problems you know mm -hmm. a lot of people come to adoption and I'm not saying everybody that's not everybody's calling there's not everybody's reason but many of the stories have some issue related to infertility which also may be related to um, age <laughs> you know yeah and so that's why a lot of people are leaning toward more towards adoption and it also aligns with um, the fact that many of many adoptive families are more economically stable, mm -hmm. um, more uh, education. So maybe people are just waiting longer, um, yeah. waiting longer to do the education and the work thing and then finding out, <laughs> you know, that infertility is a problem and then working towards adoption. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that for me, that's my experience in my cohort is that you know, and, and it's interesting because I, I think a few years ago I was having a conversation with one of, uh, a friend of mine and, and he was talking about, you know, all the highly educated folks that he knew. And I was like, yeah, well, he was like, well, you know, the numbers seem like bigger than the Census Bureau reports. And I was like, no, that's because we all hang out together. Yes, like, we all know each other. <laughs> that's it. You know, educated people hang out together. And so um, it's interesting even kind of looking at across um, the blogosphere and even in my agency and in my local community that I've kind of gotten involved in and in, in the adoption community. Um, folks are older. Mm -hmm. They're very educated and they're certainly um, more affluent. Um, although I did see that, that the number of, um, I'm not sure where that is, oh here it is, um, the number of um, adopted children that are living in poverty um, is still 14%. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still you know a significant amount of kids and again because the the definition of adoption for this particular report is so broad um, you know there's a, there's probably a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of different kinds of people a lot of different kinds of salary and economic levels education right. levels and all of that and so um, but I did find it um, shocking and kind of sad that so so many um, kids are, are still living in poverty. Mm -hmm. So those are the main things that I found on here. Well, I mean, the other thing that just reinforced the fact that we feel like we're the very few voices of people of color are speaking about it is because when you look at the numbers, really, 
the number of householders that are really doing adoption, majority of them are white, right? And so yeah. although this is the funny thing though, we're represented to, you know, around 13%. So that means we're still in the 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 average of how many, how much of us are actually in the in the general yeah. population, but we're not talking about it, right? So I I right. wonder why and so that goes back to kind of why aren't people why, and it leads into our next topic, which is yes. you know um, telling people that you're adopting. <laughs> See how yes. I did that segue? That was that was smooth. That was yeah. really smooth. Um, so yeah, this this topic I I proposed this topic um, um, after the last um, podcast. Um, shout out to the blogger, new blogger, future adopter who um, blogged, wrote a post about how she was just, you know, going all in and she was going to tell everybody um, that she was adopting and um, it seemed to be a really pleasant experience. But again, you know, we talked about, well, do we really, do we talk about this? I mean, uh, clearly we have to, people find out that we adopted. You just show up with a kid one day. We didn't right. pick them up from the cabbage patch. So, um, you know, is this something that we talk about and how did we go about telling our families? So, you know, yeah. Well, for me, um, I, I blab about it all the time. And I sometimes I think about it, like maybe you shouldn't tell everybody, but I think it would be strange for me to show up with a two year old and, and for the last, you know, four <laughs> years my husband and I have been single and happy. So, you know, I also feel like I like to get more people who look like me to be involved in foster care and adoption. So for me it's more of a kind of a testimony. It's a you know, try to drum up people's interest to let them know that it's available, you know, or that, you know, there are people that look like you that are doing it and go through it. So I didn't really have so much of a problem telling people about it. Um, of course, and we talked about this on the last podcast, you have to deal with the questions that come with right. you telling people about it. But Right, right. What about so, you? Um, you know, I, I had been talking about adopting for um, probably almost a decade, and um, so when I finally told people I was jumping in, I don't think that they believed me, because I mean, when you talk about something for 10 years, it's like, right. you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose 20 pounds, but do you ever lose it, you know, right. kind of, kind of mm -hmm. thing, and so, um, and so, you know, when I did tell people, it was kind of like, really, for real? I mean, it was always positive, but it was like, oh, okay, well, and then there was this assumption, well, it's going to take forever. So, you know, you still want to go to happy hour, kind of, right. you know, at least for my friends and that kind of stuff. I think that my family was, um, they were very supportive, but I do think that there was kind of a, do you really understand what you're getting into? Like, it, it's like a real person. Um, and, um, you know, but, but I can honestly say that despite the fact that we certainly had numerous conversations about it, looking back, those conversations maybe didn't go so deep sometimes, and um, you know it, it was kind of interesting. To your point, though, I did find as I started to tell my circle of friends, and that circle kind of started sharing, and you know it kind of really got out. I found out how many people in my life, my my personal and professional life, were adopted, mm -hmm. and it, it was a really too. it was a really shocking number of people. Um, it was a really shocking number of people, kind of just one kind of band of friends and colleagues out. Um, you know, there were like a half dozen people, mm -hmm. and so, you know, it, it, it was it was interesting. And I guess it kind of got into that, like, well, you know, now, kind of, do you tell people? What do you what do you tell people now? I mean, because especially, and I talk a little bit about this in my in my blog about same race adoption and that there, there's um, some racial privilege that comes with that in the sense of we pass. Right. And I think some people would like to, right? I have a friend, I have some friends that adopted um, overseas and, you know, I, I think they were challenged with people asking them about their adoption and really 
they were happy to move back to the states where you didn't really that wasn't part of the I guess the qualifier right mm -hmm. because they were same race even though different country but same race and so now I could go around and nobody really necessarily is going to ask me about where does she come from or you know all these other questions about it yeah. um, and so I think for some people that's their experience you know they they do they would like to I guess pass and not talk about it yeah I wonder though if adoptees the the child you know and it's hard for me to say because Nana's only two so she's not going to talk to me about it they I wonder how they feel about passing I'm sure it's not something um, that they want to talk about every day but it certainly affects maybe how they feel about themselves maybe how they interact with other people I don't know you know so well, you know, I can't, I can't, I can, I'll share what I've observed in, in my situation because, I mean, you know, Hope is now 13 and um, this the last six months in her new school, she actually was pretty transparent about the fact that she was adopted and, um, and I followed her lead on that, um, just kind of played it by ear, kind of you know, decided who she would tell. Of course, we had to tell the folks at the school, her counselors, teachers, and those kinds of things um, to kind of help us with the transition. But she did tell quite a few of her peers, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that that um, at least my observation, it felt like she needed. She felt like she needed to explain how she got here. Again, she didn't right. just crop off from a cabbage patch. She had a life before she came here. And um, and for her, the the, 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 um, the move was so huge um, from one coast to the other um, that she really felt like she wanted and needed to talk about that. Right. Um, I can tell you it, it, it didn't always go well. Um, really? it didn't it didn't always go well and um, you know I, I'm gonna tell you I've learned that I, I mean I knew this before but there's no amount of money you could pay me to go back to be 13 like mm -hmm. couldn't do it yeah. <laughs> um, scary scary time oh, it's terrible um, but you know the kids really picked on her and um, and really um, bullied her about um, whatever happened to her biological parents that made her be here. And so, in effect, some of it ended up being, oh, well, you must have been a colossal F up because you needed to be adopted. Uh -huh. And it was interesting. They didn't assign blame to parents, but they assigned blame to her most of the time. And then there were other times where it was like, oh, well, your parents must have been colossal F ups um, for you to be here. And, and it was just very hard for her, um, very, very hard for her to navigate socially. Well, uh, that's interesting because, you know, Nana's only two and a half, and she met her cousins for the first time, and I didn't really put a lot of thought into talking to our family about how to talk to Nana about it, right, or how to introduce it to our nieces and nephews. Mm. I, don't, I don't know. I, I just didn't think about it um, that much, maybe, and I would say... I don't think that was the right way to do things. Um, maybe because we're kind of isolated where we are and we don't see them that often. But while we were driving in the car, she was sitting with her three-year-old cousin. He says, I, I'm listening to them and they're back there chattering in two-year-old toddler speak, whatever they're talking. But he says, you ain't got no mama. And I said, like what? <laughs> and I'm like, where? Why? And then he asked her, who's your daddy? And I was thinking, what, what, what made him say that? You know, I don't know if that's like normal uh, toddler two, two, three year old stuff that they say to each other. Like, who's your daddy? That's my daddy. I don't know, <laughs> you know, because I'm not around enough toddlers to know like what they do. But it really bothered me because I wondered, like, what are the other kids saying? Like, what's the conversation that's happening around the table? Yeah. And so. When we talk mm. about telling other people, and especially when you bring your child into other people's life, um, I guess we may need to be more conscious of how we 
what we need to, how we set the, the space. And I guess I didn't think about it because she's two and I was like, well, what's there really to talk about? And there's probably more conversation that needs to be had since you have a teenager. But now I feel like we need to set some folks down. <laughs> like, what are you guys actually saying? <laughs> you know, right. because I don't appreciate, you know, that backseat <laughs> conversation. You ain't got no daddy. You ain't got no mama. You know, who knows where it came from. But Right. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um you know it's it's interesting because we have a, a big um, family event coming up next week, and I haven't decided if we're gonna go because it involves a, a road trip, um, and I just want to get us and keep us on schedule for the next couple of weeks and. Um, Schedule just in case you're like in the pipeline. Schedule is everything. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> routine mm -hmm. is everything. Um, but you know, my family member called me yesterday to beg me to come, and it was like, look, you got to bring her, and she's got to meet this whole bunch of people in the family. And and she was like, but just family kids are gonna be there, and um, you know, and and I could hear this like love pain, like please come because we don't know if everybody else is going to be, you know, we don't know the next time when this event like right. this with all of these people are going to happen and she needs to meet her family and there's a part of me that is like, yes, and then there's a part of me that's like, oh my god. <laughs> like, this right. could be so awesome or it could go to hell in a handbasket like the moment we walk in the door. Right. <laughs> you know, um, and how do you prepare for that? Like, you know, it's it's um, because every conversation ends up, you know, I write a script and every com conversation, you know, I kind of practice it and then it doesn't it doesn't go that way. <laughs> so right. <laughs> and do you need to have a a telephone conference with everybody in the family? Like, look, this is how you yeah. need to approach this situation because honestly, I didn't think it was necessary for a two year old, but now I feel like we need to have some. Conversations, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, because um, and so for something that big, you know, with your thirteen-year-old, that can really be impactful, and especially right. if it's their first time meeting so many people. Yeah, so many people, and I mean, I just think about even things like um, the very first event that I took her to um, happened to be some some colleagues of mine, and. You know, these are friends and colleagues, and they were just so over the moon and everything. But even things like they hug me, so they were offering to hug her. And um, you know, she likes if she if she agrees to be hugged, right. she agrees to be hugged in a certain way. Like you know, there's like there's a there's a protocol. <laughs> Okay, um, and it's based on, and it frankly is, it's just based on some trauma that she's had, and so, um, but I can't be like, you know, underarm hugs, ask first, underarm, ask first, and I mean, the idea of my family of telling them that one, they need to ask for permission to show affection, right. and then this is how you need to show it. <laughs> right. I I just. I almost I feel uncomfortable even telling them that. It's probably it, I think it creates a sense of anxiety um, around the situation, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How will and we navigate that? Yeah. And so you know I I have a lot to think about in the next week and a half about how we go and um, you know like where is the nearest Philly cheesesteak place so that we can go and be like this has been great the food is awesome peace out. <laughs> <laughs> we came like, for we two need, hours. That's enough. We, we drove for three hours to go stay for two hours. Going to pick up a chili, uh, you know, a Philly cheesesteak on the way home. Deuces, you know. And so, um, and and I just have to also. That's the other thing is that you know um, the parent has to bear the brunt, right? And so, because you know, and I don't, I don't. I don't know how it is in other communities. All I know is really my family, but you know, people have stuff to say, and it's all in love. But it's like, well, why, well, why can't I do such and such, and why can't I, like why why it's got to be that way, and why did you have to leave, and oh my goodness, and like there's tears, and you know, and um, and it's it's just because people have a hard time understanding that it's not add water and stir. Right. Absolutely. So, so we've kind of slipped a little bit over into our next topic. Um, unless you want to talk some more about telling folks that you're adopting, you have well, some I, other. 
Well, I think there was another piece that you talked about, which was the cultural nuance of we don't really tell people our business, oh, yes. right? Yes. And I think that was something that Future Adopter was kind of struggling with. Um, well, I think not telling people your business, but also um, feeling maybe like people wouldn't be supportive of your mm -hmm. ideas. And while I didn't, well, I don't really relate with that because I, I feel like people would be supportive and if they weren't, you know, really, really worry about that. Kick so rocks. Much. We're pretty strong <laughs> headed over here, you know. We run this house. But I do think that there is, you know, this kind of quietness that happens mm -hmm. and that people don't really... I, don't, I think in general people don't talk about it, right? How many yeah. people in in the general population just go around announcing, hey, we're adopting, you know, unless they're narcissistic bloggers like us, you know, who <laughs> want to put all our business out on the Internet. So, you know, when you look at the, the, this big. Look at the <laughs> report of the number of people who are actually adopting versus the number of people who are on blogs talking about it, you know, it's a pretty small percentage. <laughs> so I don't know if yeah. that's any different in in our community versus just the general community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I look at, I mean, we talked about this the last time about different support groups and I mean, and even the blogosphere that there just aren't, you know, we lurk. I think we're there. We lurk, but we just don't say much. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge. Oh, look, we have a question. We do. So we have a question from Monique. Hey, Monique. Hey. Welcome to the podcast. So the question is, I'm kind of excited. Like, whoa, we got a first know, We got a question. <laughs> My God. How did you handle the discussions about the adoption process before placement? That's one of my concerns, given that placement and the process um, as you move towards adoption is so uncertain. Oh, okay. That's a good question. So... If I understand the question right, so if not, type type something else to me. <laughs> type, type something else to us. The fact is, you know, once you start the process, you you're not in control of that. So it takes a long it can take a long time, it can take a short time before you're actually placed with some someone. And so how do you manage those conversations with family and friends where they're constantly asking you about so have you heard anything? <laughs> What's the next part of it? What, what do you do next? Um, for me, that was part of the excitement, right? So I don't want to be presumptuous, but I kind of looked at it as that was my own kind of maternity process if you, you know, look at it. So I'm going through the excitement of waiting and then the probably the angst of waiting and not hearing anything. Um, and so that's kind of how I managed it. And I, I just try to inform people and um, educate people about the process. You know, this is what's happening. I haven't heard anything. I'll let you know if, if we get a call. You know, certain people. Um, I'll let you know if we get a call or what's happening. So I think people were pretty excited to walk along with us in the process. What about you? Did you... Yeah, so, um, you know, I was just, I went to a support group last night, and, and I always end up telling the story about basically how me and Hope were like a pair of unicorns, because we didn't take a very long time in our process, and, um, you know, from start to finish, it was less than a year and a half, and a lot of people, I imagine that when you tell people that you're adopting, and then it's right. like, wait, 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 because people kind of are like, oh, well, there's kids out there, how hard can it be? <laughs> like, I mean, unless you're doing the international adoptions, which everybody assume um, takes forever, and they seem to, and are really expensive, which they also seem to be. Right. But domestic, if you're adopting domestically, people are like, well, can't you just go down to the Piggly Wiggly and go get you a kid? <laughs> and right. so, why don't you have one yet? Um, but for me and Hope, um, I told, um, certainly my immediate family knew, my circle of friends knew, um, and um, a few colleagues knew. Um, and then when I finished my home study and all of that, I mean, H Hope was um, the first profile that I got, and we were matched um, within about a month. And so I knew that, you know, I knew this thing was happening and that we would move to placement, but I told people, um, 
shortly I told more people or more people in my family shortly after I went to go make my first visit to her um, because it was like okay well you know I don't know where the paperwork what the paperwork looks like for matching anywhere else but it was like yeah you seem like a good chick, <laughs> cool chick <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this. And, you know, then it was all about um, figuring out when I would go out to visit, um, when, you know, when phone calls would start, when we go out to visit and those kinds of things. Um, and so that I didn't have a long period of time between um, when I told people and when, um, you know, there was really something to talk about. Like I could see her, I would, could send pictures, um, well, not many pictures, but, you know, I could at mm -hmm. least share some pictures with my immediate family and those kinds of things. Um, but for, for folks that are waiting for a really long time, I, um, my sense is that um, there probably is some fatigue on both sides, yes. some, fatigue about, some fatigue about being asked about it because it seems so painful for a lot of families that because they're waiting for so long and fatigue for the people that are supporting them like it hasn't happened yet <laughs> is this really happening <laughs> well what's like, wrong what's with you <laughs> I you agree with that because I, I remember there was this time um, in my process where in our process where we had finished the paperwork and we had turned it in, we had gotten our license, and I was like, yes, we got our license, and I expected, I'm like, well, you know, we are us, so this should not take, I mean, I should be getting a call next week, you know, and I'd read on blogs where people would get a call for a child, like, in a week or so, I was like, okay, and then we didn't, and I had told everybody, like, okay, get ready for this, you know, I'm ready for my baby shower, so, you know, y'all need to start right. preparing and nothing happened <laughs> really nothing happened and I, I, I wanted to have a child in the house by Christmas nope Thanksgiving went by Christmas went by and so I agree with you that does become to get some fatigue people stop asking people yeah. stop asking um, but again this is your process it is and it can be somewhat a lonely process and that's where you need your support groups you need other people that are going through the process at the same time to ha be happy for you to have the same angst because even when you actually tell someone hey I got a call I'm gonna be putting a RAS or something like that people are like I don't know what that means <laughs> like, am I supposed to be happy for you or not so you really do need yeah. some other people on your side that understand the process and can go through it with you. And yeah. we're here, so yeah. let us yeah. know. Yeah, keep on blogging and um, we're, we're following. We're following. Um, so um, we some parts of this telling people conversation, um, we've touched a little bit on kind of what's normal or kind of the new normal <laughs> without Nene, <laughs> without Nene. <laughs> Um, but what's the new normal and as an adoptive families will we ever be normal um, and um, certainly there's like insane race adoptions you know you can kind of pass um, Nana is so young that yep. you know um, there will be people that come into your life that really just assume you know um, that she um, you know is your biological child um, and then there's the whole nature versus nurture thing, you know, and, and the influences that we have over our kids, at least by nurture. Um, but what is what is the adoptive family's version of normal? And is there a time when we don't have to disclose, when we don't have to tell people? Well, I don't, th if, I don't think you ever necessarily have to tell anybody anything about your family, right? So when we meet new people I wouldn't necessarily say hey this is my adoptive daughter that's my child right. that's my daughter um, and I don't need to put a qualifier on it however when we say normal I guess um, I think adopted family adoptive family is just always going to be part of our normal the same way african-american is part of the qualifier of our family the same way um, you know if we had any kind of disabilities in our family all of these things you know you know wherever we live you know midwesterners all these things 
happen to shape you know our sensibilities the way we do things the our outlook on it so I don't know if there's ever going to be um, I guess I wouldn't even maybe use the term normal it just is what mm -hmm. it is so we're always going to be looking through things through that lens and it's it's mm -hmm. different for every family so another family may be looking through the lens of autism you know another family yeah. may be looking through the lens of middle classness or you right. know whatever right. uh, suburbia you know there's all these different things that kind of impact the way that you view your family and so maybe maybe by kind of making adoptive versus normal uh, a dichotomy mm. we might be doing mm -hmm. a disservice to ourselves mm. it's a great it's a great perspective I think that um, I struggle with this not because I mean um, not with um, colleagues and friends and those kinds of things but but um, with schooling um, certainly for us that that disclosure was really important um, and um, you know she's doing well academically and that kind of thing but just behaviorally we've really struggled and um, even this week with the, the um, episode that we had with um, the day camp that she's in and you know I had to like go down there go down there go regulate, <laughs> you know, go regulate some things <laughs> on everybody's part <laughs> on everybody's part um, but it was interesting because I hadn't disclosed um, that we're an adoptive family and that we're a new adoptive family. And um, when she started the camp, and um, I found myself having to t uh, disclo had to disclose it this week. And it was interesting because you know these are also educators, and so and it just hadn't occurred to me that I probably needed to tell them that going into the process. Um, but it was like I literally saw the light bulbs come on and they were like oh well that explains a whole lot about what happened <laughs> in the last couple of days and so um, so you know there's the, the disclosures that of course that are necessary in order to advocate for your child um, and I guess it's I'm finding that um, in our social systems it's it I'm finding the need um, and I, I hate like saying, okay, well, this is this is this is our explanation as a crutch. But I'm like, there are just some behavioral things that we're still really kind of working on that um, you know I end up having to disclose in order to add context to to the situation to help folks make it help me make it manageable. Right. And I guess if I understand what you're saying, is is there ever going to be a time where we can just um, walk around yeah. in the world without having to think about adoption and you know there was a a, a blog that um, someone wrote about this and I did I find the blog it was on adoption.net um, mm. and it was called taking the adoptive qualifier yes. out of parenting yes and so um, she talks about this and I like I said I'm not sure if I agree with it but um, she says that now she she's a transracial she they're a transracial family so of course when they what she says is when they venture out to the park or get ice cream or stand in line they're often reminded that the, the children are not biologically ours we're used to the predictable questions the second glances and the compliments we've heard it all and seen it all when these things happen we are reminded that we are different mainly because they're a transracial family mm -hmm. but she says our differences do not outweigh our normal. Adoptive parents need to know that it's healthy and permissive to be just parents, minus the adoptive qualifier. Yeah. So first you need to, and these are the reasons she gives. First you need to be able to live free without explanations or excuses or justifications. So you're your child's mom or dad, period. And I agree with that, you yeah. know. I don't have to qualify that this is my adoptive child. That's just my child. Right. Um, Second, you need to know who you are because society will question your intentions, your choices, and your validity as a parent of a child who was adopted. Um, she, she goes on to talk about the qualifier of adoptive um, or adoptive is used in media usually when you're talking about celebrities and it also makes 
adoptive parents made out to be, you know, the saviors. So she she just says that it's it's um, detrimental um, to go around and it's detrimental to the adoption community and triad members because when people hear that a person's adopted or that you're an adoptive parent, they already have some notion in their mind about what that means and, and stereotypes because of what's portrayed in the media. And then, mm -hmm. lastly, you need to grace and grasp and embrace that adoption once finalized or made official. It's a past action. Mm. A child whose adoption who has been finalized it is a child who was adopted, not a child who is adopted. Wow. Well, I was good with the first two things she said, but the last one, I don't know. Because um, I also read a blog, and I'll have to find it. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. A blog by an adoptee. And she was talking about this whole thing about is adopted versus was adopted. And again, it goes back to the fact that it, just because I was, you know, the past action, um, you make it sound like this happened and now I never have to think about it again. Mm -hmm. However, for an adoptee, adoption impacts all, there's loss associated with adoption, yeah. right? And so I'm never going to just be like, you know, <laughs> this happened like I, I broke my leg and that was it <laughs> you yeah, know it healed right. and I'm done I don't have to refer back to it again or not no it's part of who I am and so it's really going to have an impact now how much that impacts each person is very personal and it's probably a spectrum but I don't know if I agree with just saying once you're adopted that's a past action and we don't have to refer to Talk it, about it anymore. yeah what do you yeah, think? I, I don't know how I feel about that either. Um, you know, I think that it is a past action, but, it, it, but you know, coming to make a family that way is, is different. And, you know, I, I had in some of our, our prep notes kind of, you know, even thinking about us as parents, how, how would we have prepared differently? Right. Um, if you read our blogs, you realize that both um, Mimi and I are dealing with kids that are teething. Yes, which is crazy because they're like 10 years apart, 12 <laughs> ten years, years apart. apart. <laughs> you know, and I just remember when I, when, when I read your blog about like, she's two and she's teething and I was like, we don't know nothing about birth and no babies. So, because <laughs> like, um, I mean, a couple weeks ago, seriously, like the science teacher was like, no, no, Ms. Graham, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. So-and-so, Ms. ABM, um, that, you know, these are 12-year molars. Um, and so... Um, yeah, it, it was crazy. So, but you do know, you how think it's we... because, um, how do I say this? Have, have we been fully integrated into the parenting society? I mean, we just yeah. popped up with some children, yeah. right? So it's not like we have a group of other mothers that we can be like, yeah, so and so is teething. I don't have anybody really that you know, I'm talking to about those things where I would just pick up naturally because I, I know some other parents whose children are a little bit older than mine. People aren't, I don't, I don't necessarily have that type of network. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that we're, we're, I think that, no, I don't have that network. I mean, I just think that, that, um, we're kind of winging it. Um, right. and, um, and one of the things that I did, you know, this kind of was adopted is adopted. It, you know, I, I, I need to chew on that a little bit more because I'm not sure how I feel about it because I do think that there's a, I mean, it was an action and it, we celebrate it for us. Um, it's a very recent action, but, I mean, it's not over. Like, <laughs> right. it's not over. Um, you know, the transition is still very much a very real thing for us. Maybe in a year or two it really will be a past action. But it's still a very real process for us right now that um, that doesn't allow us to totally remove the qualifier at this time. You know, I I think about it in some ways. Like I grew up without a stable father figure, and so that could be you're grown, get over that. But it does inform how I view relationships. It, I remember it having a very strong impact on me when I was in college and I needed, you know, my car broke down and I was like, man, it'd be nice if I had a dad that I could call and, and you know, talk, have them talk to the, the people at the, the, um, the mechanic shop. So I just, I do feel like 
I think it is something to continue to chew over, but I do think that even those things that impact us and they may not have the same kind of terminal quality as the word adoptive, they continue to impact our lives all through it, you know, yeah. so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, normal apparently is overrated anyway, so there exactly. You go. We're the new normal. How about that? <laughs> We're that, the new normal. We're the is. new normal. Um, well, we have a few minutes left, so now is time for our recommendations. All right. Ooh, 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 ooh. These are things that we've um, learned and picked up on our short journeys that we uh, decide to think is important. Maybe they they were aha moments for us. Maybe they might be aha moments for you too. Mimi, what you got? Well. I have a couple of things. One of them um, is the Foster Parenting Podcast. So when I started looking into foster care, there's a podcast that I found on iTunes. It's called Foster Parenting Podcast. Um, the hosts are Tim and Wendy. And I think if you're interested in doing foster care, and they, they talk about foster care from the point where they, I think, got their license to the point where they actually adopted a child and then they had some other co-hosts that came on to talk about different aspects of foster care. Um, they don't post anymore but the archive is there and I think it's a great, if you're interested in really understanding kind of all the steps involved, it's a great podcast because they're doing, they do a good job of being very strict about what they talk about, <laughs> being very specific, and laying out all the steps um, for foster care. So that's one. And then the other thing I found was, you know, since I have a two-year-old, I can't listen to everything that I want to listen to in the car. So um, I found these things called Rockabye Baby uh, Lullabies of Hip Hop. <laughs> And so you can see, you can go see them on, you can go find it at rockabybabymusic.com. And they have like Jay-Z, they have Kanye West. Really? Yeah, they do. And I said, well, let me see if I can play just a little bit so you can, you know, feel kind of what I'm what I'm dealing with over here. So I'm going to just play just a, just a snippet so people can, can hear it. So can you hear that? Nope. No? Okay, I hear something. Are you over there jamming by yourself? I'm jamming by myself. Okay, so <laughs> if you cannot get it, but you can go onto YouTube, look up Rockabye Baby, Kanye West, um, <laughs> or Rockabye Baby, Jay-Z. I was over here like, do, 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 do. Mm -mm. So anyway, um, it's a straight <laughs> instrumental. So go look it up. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> now I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna be on YouTube all night. Um, so my recommendation this week is, and I wish I had pulled it off um, the refrigerator, but we have a couple of magnets. Um, those magnets with the faces on them, um, and it's the "How do you feel today?" Ooh. with all of the different emotions, and. Um, and um, this was actually Hope's idea um, because we were really struggling with some stuff this week about how were we feeling about things that were happening in the house. And, um, you know, she said, I'm going to go get this thing because, I mean, I've had them on the refrigerator for years, long before she came um, into my life. And um, she pulled them off the refrigerator and was like, I feel like this and this and this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> and then she was like, you know, how do you feel? And I was like, I feel like this and this and this and this. I mean, how detailed are you this one, this one. <laughs> Well, you know what? Okay, I'm going to just run and go get it and hold it. Go get it because I need moment. to see it. <laughs> So while she is running, I wish I could make this work so you guys can hear my little song. All right. Okay, she's back. Okay. I'm back. I'm back. So um, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see it? Put it up a little bit closer. So. Okay. Yes. Okay. You kind of get a sense of that. These are the how do you feel. And they come with these little things. You can probably get them on Amazon, I'm sure, or somewhere. Um, and it has the how do you feel today um, mm -hmm. there. And so this one has one, two, three, four, five, six. This one has 30 different emotions. 
Um, but not to be outdone, we've got another one that has another like 20 some because <laughs> we are very emotional at the time. Yeah, I have a lot of feelings <laughs> over there. We are in our feelings, honey. And so, um, and it was really interesting because we put them on the table as we were talking and we were like, well, I feel this way and this way and this way. And, and you know, it was really interesting for us to kind of, for her, it was great that she came up with this idea to use this because a lot of times, and I don't think that we realize this even as adults, that, that we're not really just feeling one emotion. We're probably feeling like 12. <laughs> Um, and usually there's a dominant emotion that kind of, you know, like anger is usually a wrapped up in a whole bunch of stuff. So is grief. And, and, um, and, and so being able to kind of parse through um, the different components um, is, um, was really, really helpful for us. So um, definitely I would recommend you go on out and get you a how do you feel today magnet for your refrigerator. <laughs> I'm going to get like one us. for wood, wood and ice. You know, <laughs> how do you feel? This is how I feel today. You know, I think it's probably great for any relationship. And so um, get that, slap it on the refrigerator, put it on the bathroom mirror. There you go. So there's my recommendation for the week. Very, very helpful in our house this week. So looks like we are at 11 o'clock. So um, that was fun. And it went that fast. That was fun. How do you, <laughs> so how, how can people find you? So you can find me um, on WordPress um, at adoptiveblackmomwordpress.com and on um, Twitter, the Twitters at um, adoptiveblackmom. Um, and uh, you can also reach me by email at adoptiveblackmom at gmail.com. Yes, and you can reach me at complicatedmelody uh, with an I dot wordpress dot com you can read the blog you can email me at complicated melody with an i at gmail dot com and you can find me on the twitters I started to tweet a little bit more I, saw. Um, I know uh, at Mimi complex um, and so we hope to see you guys in another two weeks um, tell people about it tweet about it let people know that we're out here talking about adoption, foster care, yeah. and communities of color. And we hope to see you guys in another two weeks. Absolutely. Have fun and have a great couple of weeks. All right. Bye. Bye.